Hi guys, uh, my name is Deeraj. I'm here with Voice Magazine and I am joined by one of the artists whose work featured in the UK NA Takeover in Leicester this past weekend. Um, I'll pass over to him to introduce himself. Hello everyone. Thank you Deeraj for uh, interviewing me today. My name is Piotr Krzymowski. I am a London-based artist. Um, I came to London 14 years ago. I studied um, fine arts at Central St. Martins in London, and I've been in the UK since. Um, and that's correct. I had two artworks um, at the UK and a city takeover. I had a video work um, called COVID Alphabet after Amanda Liar, which was um, a cover of uh, the French singer Amanda Liar uh, song, um, and I utilized Google search engine to create a contemporary version of it. And I also had a series of um, free screen prints that were featuring my fingerprints collected from the screen of my iPhone. And I guess this is what Dirac is mainly interested in today. So I'll be happy to answer all his questions. Perfect. So. First of all, I'd like to thank you for taking the time. Uh, before we jump into the artwork that I saw, I'd love to discuss your entry into arts and culture in general. Um, I read that you're a graduate of, like you just said, uh, Central St. Martins. So I was wondering, is that the route that you'd recommend uh, any budding artists pursue to get into this? I have such great memories of Central St. Martins um, and the reason why I chose this school over any other is because of the way they um, teach and um, the amazing open-mindedness that there is um, in, uh, in, in, in the college. And I had a choice of either staying in Poland and continuing my art education there. And um, Poland offers a very traditional way of education. So, uh, it's prioritizing um, the craftsmanship uh, over a space for ideas and mistakes and experimentation. So one would graduate with amazing skills, but not necessarily an idea how to use them. And I guess that was the main reason why I chose um, Central St. Martins, um, like most of the universities in the UK and in Central Europe, so to, so to speak, uh, it offers exactly that open-minded way of um, education. So one would just get an empty studio and one would experiment with all sorts of ideas um, that would come to the fresh um, mind of a student. And it was really, really great and, and powerful. And um, after the ideas came, then one would sign up to different courses and um, you know master either filmmaking or performance art or drawing or sculpture uh, but the, the the initial stage was um, basically based on ideas and, and experimentation. That's interesting do you think that emphasis on the conceptual side of things informed your work today? Definitely, uh, because every single idea was then um, turned into a research process. And through that research, one would learn a lot about the history of um, art and one would contextualize their ideas. And one would essentially end up with, with a concept. And I think um, it is very typical um, for contemporary artists to, to be able to speak about what they do through different references mm -hmm. through um, concepts, through constant, yeah, constant referring to what has been done and, and the world around us. Great. Uh, you mentioned you had two uh, exhibitions at the takeover. I didn't actually get a chance to see the video one, um, but the one that I saw was A Touch Too Much. Um, now I'm sure you've in my research, I saw that you've discussed the creative process behind it plenty of times. But do you mind just quickly running us through the story? Because I think it's really interesting. 
Sure. So um, a big part of my practice is related to technology, to the, um, to the internet, and I'm looking at um, how these two are altering our behaviors and making us either less or more um, human. And I remember being on a flight and grabbing one of the magazines that um, there were on the flight. And you know, on the, on the, being on the flight is probably the only time when we don't use the phones because we don't have the, the connection. So um, I was totally disconnected and I grabbed the magazine and the first article that I was um, reading, which was quite ironic, was about uh, the smartphones. And I remember, one specific um, piece of information really struck me, um, which said that on average, we touch the screen of our phones, smartphones, 5,600 times a day. Wow. And that obviously includes um, typing, that includes swiping, that includes all sorts of new choreography that our hands had to um, learn through, through the use of the smartphones. And I was, I had this desire to, to want to picture how that daily journey of my fingers really look like. So um, that's when, when the idea started. And eventually I um, used the aluminum powder, which is typically used by the police to uh, get the fingerprints. And I would cover the screen of my phone um, at the end of each day. Uh, just to figure out what that um, subconscious journey that I would daily do um, looks like. Because obviously once we operate um, the phone, we are so focused on what we are doing and it actually is a conscious act, but we are not really seeing um, the traces that we leave. So I was very much interested in, in that. And since it's a very contemporary uh, technology, the smartphone. I wanted to juxtapose that with, um, with, a, with a very traditional process of image making, which is screen printing. Um, so I've approached um, a screen printing studio that uh, is right next to my studio in East London. And I, I produced it there. Um, I also produced it using a very specific ink called thermochromic ink. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure you uh, have experienced it. I, would, I would hope you experienced it. Did you have a chance to touch it? I did, I did. Uh, it'll so, lead to my next question, actually. I really like that element of it. So thermochromic ink basically consists of um, special chemicals that allow the ink to temporarily uh, become translucent. Um, when it gets in touch with a heated surface. So um, I did want to continue the interactive element of, of this work. So from me touching the screen of my phone to the audience touching the surface of the artwork. And then I came across this, um, this fantastic ink, um, which allowed for that interaction to happen. So, um, Basically, the audience is invited to leave their own fleeting mark on the top of um, my marks. And, um, and that also um, suggests the sort of organic element, uh, the human element of, of technology, of the artificial intelligence, because it is becoming um, more like us. Um, technology has in theory at least, um, more feelings, it seems more human. Um, and and I, wanted, I wanted that to be reflected in the work. Yeah, and uh, you've, you've done my job for me, you've led into our next question. Um, what I really liked about the uh, piece is, I feel like often art traditionally, uh, the images, it's behind like a rope, you're not allowed to touch it, you're not allowed to interact with it at all. But like you said, the ink that you used, it, it encourages uh, interaction with the piece. Uh, was that a conscious decision, I'm assuming, to have that interactivity? It, it absolutely was. Um, as I said, I wanted to continue um, the tactile experience from, um, you know, from me touching the screen of my phone to the audience, then touching the artwork. And also, 
the work was um, firstly uh, produced in 2019 and also exhibited at my exhibition in um, Poland called Homo Cellularis at the Center of Contemporary Arts in Toruń, um, pre-COVID, pre-pandemic. And I think looking at it today, um, it also got a new layer um, of, of looking at it because if you think about all these lockdowns and how isolated we were, technology was the only medium that would allow us to stay in touch with our family, with our friends, with the rest of the world. And, um, and this is also, uh, this, this, this work may be seen as looking at the evidence of that, um, of that touch, of staying in touch with, with the rest of the world. And uh, you spoke about using the aluminium film and the thermochromic ink. Um, again, traditionally, when someone like me, who may not be too initiated with the arts and culture world, thinks of art, you think of uh, painting. Um, do you enjoy using these more kind of unconventional mediums as opposed to the paintbrush that you typically associate with artwork? Um... When people ask me what I do and I say that I'm an artist, they um, usually ask me to show them my paintings. Um, <laughs> and um, I'm not a painter. I have not been uh, trained as one. Um, and as we spoke earlier, um, today artists work with so many concepts and so many ideas and very often they don't even execute them. And I think um, that it's, it's a very liberating discipline and uh, it doesn't need to be constrained to any specific mediums. Um, but I didn't consciously choose to, to work with these uh, two um, mediums to answer your question. Um, they just happened to come up as I was um, working on, on that piece, as I was researching materials. So again, my journey usually doesn't start with the material or medium, it starts with an idea and the execution um, is a fantastic journey that um, has, you know, many destinations. Mm. Do you think it ties back to your saying at Central St. Martin's, the emphasis on concepts? Definitely, um, definitely. And that just reminded me about the very first task that we were given at St. Martin's. Um, we were locked in a room full of objects and we would be put into groups and we were invited to communicate through these objects and to create something out of these objects and also have a very uh, coherent um, idea behind it and, and justification of what we're doing. And historically, um, you know, in, in the 80s, so I've heard that uh, students would actually be locked nonstop for 24 <laughs> hours um, to, to come up with, with, um, with these ideas. Uh, today, I don't think that would pass the health <laughs> situation um, since everything is, is so proper and and we can't do things that we used to do in the past um so but still you know um that tradition continues uh and and i think that example shows very well how um art schools like say martin's operate mm. and you mentioned uh the fact that so many different mediums are used nowadays uh which makes me interested into how you'd personally define uh, what art is? It doesn't have one definition and I wouldn't dare to, to answer that question. It, it comes in different shapes and colors and it, um, it is an open-ended territory. And I think this is where the beauty of, of it is. Um, I also think that art has the power um, and, and the potential to reflect on the current, um, on, on, what current, on what currently is happening in the world, um, whether from the political point of view or social point of view or technological point of view. Mm -hmm. And 
And it's great to see the world differently through art um, because it definitely has the capacity to present it um, differently. Yeah, that's an interesting point because I know you made a touch too much pre-pandemic, but like you said, the pandemic really added another layer to it. So it's quite a fitting kind of reflection of society. Um, so to finish, uh, I'm going to ask you a bit more of a lighthearted question. In my research, I noticed you knew all these brilliant little facts about technology. What is the most interesting fact you could share with us? So I have prepared actually some quotes because I'm so bad at remembering things. Don't worry so much. Um, and actually, you know, I am bad at remembering things. It's I'm blaming uh, technology because today we don't need to remember anything. Um, it's true. there on our phone. When we lose our phone, we feel like the world is coming to an end because we don't <laughs> even know our, our own name when that happens. And I remember when I was a little boy and I lived in the north of Poland, I would remember all the phone numbers by heart. And I'm sure um, you are much younger than me, but um, I'm assuming, but you probably also have a similar experience um, yeah. of how your memory worked at the very, you know, at your younger age. Mm, absolutely. Do you, Were you born pre-internet, post-internet? I was born in 98, so I feel like it's kind of, it's in that middle ground. Uh, growing up, I completely know what you mean. Like I, <laughs> the first phone number I memorized was my dad's work number. Uh, it was on a landline phone. And now I feel like people don't even have a landline. Um, but my sister is growing up, is growing up around all this technology. And like you said, she doesn't have a need to. Um, but back to the fun fact. So one of them I found in a brilliant book called The Age of Earthquakes. Um, that was um, co-written by Schumann Bazar, Douglas Copeland, and Hans Ulrich Obrist. And it says that 20 years ago, the internet used 0% of human energy consumption. By the way, this is around the time when you were born. Um, <laughs> today, the digital economy uses 10% of the world's total electricity. Wow. And it's the same amount that was used to light the entire planet in 1985. Really? Um, just yes, digital I, consumption now. That's insane. Yes. Just the digital economy itself. Wow. Um, another interesting piece of information, um, a quote they, they really, really liked and I totally agree with. Uh, that says, we haven't just changed the structure of our brains these past few years. We have changed the structure of our planet. And that basically has to do with overconsumption on many levels. Um, what else do I have? Um, the more you offload your memories onto hard drives, that's exactly what I was telling you about um, when I was mentioning the phone uh, numbers and how my memory stopped working uh, since the invention of the smartphones. So uh, the more you offload your memories onto hard drives and into the cloud, the more your memory becomes, in a very real sense, artificial. Technically, someone who spends all day in front of a screen has no memories of their own, except for going to the fridge for a Coke. Mm. Um, another quote from a book by, actually it's an article by Corina Gardner. Okay. Um, the article is titled, titled iPhone and was published in The Future Starts Here, a brilliant book that was accompanying an exhibition at the V&A in London. Um, the quote says, our transformation into a gadget-oriented society has been rapid. Not carrying smartphone is seen as a sign of eccentricity, marginalization, opting out, or old age. Um, on ourselves, clothes at hand or in use, mobile is our everyday. Our dependency is such that many of us reach for our phones as soon as we wake up and then go on to check them on average every six and a half minutes over the course of a day. 
Traffic lights have been installed on pavements in cities from Germany to Australia to prevent accidents caused by pedestrians distracted by their phones. Phone-induced obliviousness is so pervasive that the word swamby, a mashup of smartphone and zombie, was voted German Youth Word of the Year in 2015. Young people are devising new modes of communication that make no distinction between the real and online worlds. Conversations with friends are layered up with digital chatter with those physically present and those located elsewhere. Ever contactable plans to meet friends are rarely made ahead of time. And the distinction between work and home life has been eroded to the extent that the French um, legislator have passed the right to disconnect into law. Oh, wow. Okay. Just, um, it'd be interesting to get your thoughts on this, just inspired by some of those quotes. Do you think that the proliferation of technology is an inherently good or bad thing? I think the, the development of technology, the internet by itself is not a bad thing. I think the way we use it is certainly raising a lot of questions or the way we overuse it mm. um, has certainly a lot of um, mental consequences on us and on the ever growing younger generations. Um, we, you know, th there are a lot of examples from social media to, um, to all, all forms of bullying that happen um, on the internet to uh, the porn industry and and how um, you know once it once once the pornographic material gets in hands um, of of young people, it, it certainly creates a very wrong um, idea of what um, sex is like. Um, different expectations arise. Um, so again, the internet is not a bad thing. Um, just how we use it is terrible. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Uh, just to finish up, do you uh, have any upcoming projects and where can people find you to follow your work? Um, I currently am taking a lot of time in the studio to um, just relax and um, experiment with new ideas. Uh, I had a show last year in London at Project 13 called Major Incident, mm -hmm. uh, which was made entirely out of COVID waste. So um, I have made a promise to myself since then to cut on, um, on basically getting or producing new works from new materials. Um, I have been accumulating a lot of objects in the studio from the clothes that I no longer wear to things I find on the street to things that my friends want to get rid of and um, I'm experimenting with these right now, but there are, there are currently no, no planned shows and I have uh, no problem admitting that. I think it's, it's healthy to, to have a moment of a pause and, and just to reflect on, on what one does. Yeah, definitely. I feel like there's a lot of emphasis nowadays to constantly kind of be in sixth gear, just go, 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 and no one really takes a moment. Um, whilst you're not actively working on anything, can people find you on social media or anything to keep up to date with your work? Um, yes, once they manage to uh, spell my <laughs> very complicated uh, name well, and surname. Uh, I will, um, I'll drop them um, below uh, for people to find. Um, so that will be helpful. Yeah, if you just, uh, are you on... I'm assuming you've got, a, I noticed you had a website. Um, and then, is it Instagram? Instagram? Perfect. Great. I will drop that below. Uh, thank you again for taking the time. Really appreciate it. Was a, it was a pleasure, Diraj. And thank you for um, your interest in my work and my practice. Thank you.